Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third live stream workshop event with the EVM X Ideathon hackathon event. So previously, if you haven't seen them yet, there are uh, some additional pre uh, workshops that we've had leading up to this one, and those are available on the Helios YouTube channel under the uh, EVM X Ideathon playlist. If you haven't seen those. There we've got an opening ceremony which describes this entire event and how to participate and uh, what uh, maybe a little teaser on each of these workshops that we've been having. Additionally, we've got the very first workshop, which was a design thinking workshop, things you should consider, some do's and don'ts as you start to come up with and craft your idea for submission or for your EVM GameFi submission for the Trust EVM. After that, we had a pitch deck workshop with uh, Gabriel Shaw, where basically as part of your delivery and what you'll be submitting with the EVM, uh, with the Ideathon pro, uh, side at least, you'll need to submit a pitch deck. So how do you create a pitch deck? What goes into a good pitch deck? Again, some do's and don'ts. So I highly encourage folks to have a look at that if you're looking for what to have there. And today now we have the Antelope Workshop, and this will be giving some high level uh, technical teasers, some do's and don'ts as well, uh, but what you should and shouldn't be considering when building on a blockchain, a blockchain application. So for those who aren't familiar, the EVM uh, X Ideathon is a hackathon with two distinct tracks. We've got the EVM track, which is a GameFi focused application built on the Trust EVM coming to EOS. Uh, you will have to actually deploy code that will need to be running on the testnet for the Trust EVM in order to qualify. And that is again, focused on GameFi. And that has a $50,000 prize pool available. Then the second track is the Ideathon track, which has five distinct categories. We've got GameFi as well. Then there is Gov3, Game, I sorry to say GameFi. There's a Gov3, Web3, Social Good, and there is one other one that has slipped my mind. But uh, there's one other category, and it's probably something important. But you can check it out. It's all available on the DevPost uh, website. So if you go to EVMX Ideathon, dot devpost.com you will find the full details all the rules how to sign up so far we have 321 participants registered that's a, a good number there's another 27 days left where you can register and submit your application or your your project to receive some prizes for the ev for the ideathon we've got a seventy five thousand dollar prize pool available so Lots of money there. It's uh, it, it's definitely worth people's time for the ideathon. Really, there's no code required. Just a pitch deck, a video of someone on your team or yourself if you're a solo uh, member delivering that pitch deck and a, a brief description. So really easy, low barrier to entry to participate. The uh, the, the actual event will submissions will be closed on October 31st. So still have a bit of time, and there still are two more uh, workshops coming up. We've got uh, the we've been having. Uh, community building, developer building workshop coming up as well, and uh, tokenomics and gamification coming next week. So all of those you'll find in the, uh, the Helios playlist for EVM X Ideathon in terms of the dates, and you can set those in your calendar. So today we are doing the Antelope workshop. And for us, with us today, we've got Eric Passmore, who is currently a director with the EOS Network Foundation and has many years experience in the tech space, ranging from posts with CNET, MacroPlay, Morgan Stanley, AOL, and Microsoft, name, to name a few. He also has an entrepreneurial spirit, having endeavored into building uh, a company to create an inventory management system in the cloud and building consumer applications and services to create small, financially independent communities. On top of that, he wrote a book, Migrating Large-Scale Services to the Cloud, which is available on Amazon. And so with that, I will bring Eric to the stream. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, so uh, happy to be here. I'm Eric. I'm a director of mobile and web uh, at the in EOS uh, Network Foundation. And today I'm here to talk to you about EOS, give you an overview of the EOS, uh, of EOS and what's in there, and then uh, talk about Antelope too, which is the technology, the blockchain technology that supports the EOS network. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to get out of your way and we'll bring up the slides and you can run through folks. If you have any questions for Eric, this is, this is live. So, um, yeah. by all means, enter your questions into the chat. I'll bring those up for Eric to review, uh, and definitely try to take advantage of this live experience where you can have all of your questions, uh, hopefully answered. So thank you very much, Eric. I'll let you take it away. Yeah, it'd be, it's great to get questions, have a little more, uh, interactive experience. Oh, all right. Uh, again, EOS technical overview. I'm Eric Passmore at the EOS Network Foundation. So let's just dive right into it. What is EOS? Well, 
EOS is both the community and the technology supporting open source blockchain. The technology part of it includes things like a blockchain, smart contracts, uh, tools, SDKs, but the community is important too because those are the block producers that come together and build out uh, and help us build out our, our uh, distributed organization and, our, and support our blockchain. Antelope is the actual technology. It's the blockchain. It's the data blockchain that supports the smart contracts. And it, like I mentioned, Antelope is supported by a distributed community and has a great track record with four years of continuous uptime. The nice things to note about and Antelope just off the top is it's fast, it scales, and it's a proven technology. And I'll get into some of those specifics later. Antelope has some powerful capabilities that we're going to go over as well. So Antelope supports tables, which allow for updates, inserts, deletes, and also sorting. Smart contracts are written in C++, so that's a rich language for you to write your logic for your distributed apps. And then Antelope has some fine-grained permissions, enabling your app to unlock sets of features. And we'll go over some of those examples and you know why that might be interesting to you. So an important note, uh, you can't make external calls uh, from within your smart contracts. The, uh, you, that means that you can't make an HTTP call from your contract out to fetch data or bring it back. You know, when your smart contracts are working, they can only work off of data that's already in the blockchain or data that's passed in those parameters or arguments to your smart contracts. So we're going to go over some of, more of this stuff, but what's possible with EOS? Well, we're going to go, talk about user profiles that can be stored on the blockchain, uh, storing telemetry for IoT, which is Internet of Things devices, tracking the state of play for games, uh, managing government licenses and certifications, order books and order flow. And um, a lot of these things are possible because of the scale and also the speed uh, that we have in, in Antelope. Uh, so we'll dive a little bit more into the speed and the scale. We'll also talk a little bit about smart contracts, uh, persisting data, which is interesting because you have some options on persisting data, accounts and permissions, and how to examine the blockchain transactions. So let's get into some specifics about the scale and the speed. Uh, blocks are finalized in half a second, and consensus among the block producers takes uh, about two. It takes two minutes. Uh, to be clear, when you write something, it's immediately available to you, and you can see that. When the block is written, it's written on that particular node, and then the block producers work together to get consensus. And after it has consensus, that block's immutable. Now, it's not going to be forked. It's not going to be changed. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about some of these speed numbers. Uh, now, that half second is pretty fast, and that's an important number. That really gives you an idea of how interactive you can be. The scale specifics, uh, gotten up to 9,656 transactions per second in the test network. And routinely, the network's handling thousands of transactions per second. And like I said, it's been up and running for four years. So when you go back and, and think about some of the solutions and some of the things you can do, you can really think big You can think about covering a large number of people, large number of contracts, uh, large scale scenarios can definitely be supported. <laughs> um, like, uh, so, you know, large scale solutions can be like IoT. You could have lots of devices that are connected all reporting in their own telemetry, uh, gathering that data up and being able to process it. Uh, social networks, those can be pretty big. Government licensing, if you're dealing with government, government agencies, they can have large volumes that are, that are coming in and the U.S. can handle those scenarios today. I'm going to jump into uh, smart contracts a little bit. So what is a smart contract? It's uh, basically a function that runs inside the virtual machine on the Antelope blockchain. They're written in C++. And smart contracts have access to the blockchain accounts, the blockchain on-chain data, uh, and also tables that are there as well. And of course, you can pass in values to your smart contracts as well. Eric, just a, Eric. a question on the language C++. Um, sometimes that's, that comes up as you know, maybe a barrier to entry if someone doesn't know C++. Are there any other languages that one could uh, write contracts in that are still uh, would still work on EOS? Yeah, there's um, 
you know, so it runs in a, in a virtual machine. And so anything that language they compile for that virtual machine could work. Uh, so there are open source projects where you can actually use uh, TypeScript and write your contracts in TypeScript. Although I haven't personally seen any of those working end to end. The C++ has the advantage of um, having some libraries that we already have in place and some system contracts. But you could certainly write contracts on other languages. You just may not have access to some of the state primitives that we have uh, in C++. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Thank you. Perfect. Uh, so what are examples of smart contracts? Uh, again, I just want to cover some basics uh, for some folks if you're new. Uh, smart contract could be like self-registering a device. So a device can go, call smart contract, register itself. Uh, issuing a participation token, uh, validating a certificate, approving ownership, transferring an asset, and recording the transaction. These are all things that smart contracts can do as some simple examples. Uh, Next, I'm going to move into persisting uh, data. Um, persisting data is a pretty interesting conversation because you have some choices here and there's uh, some trade-offs. We're going to cover this in sort of three general categories. One category is on blockchain. So those are the transactions that live on the blockchain as immutable records. There's off blockchain data. That's data that stores that you own, you manage, and you maintain. Could be caches that you own and manage and maintain as well. And lastly, there's envelope tables. So that's that create, update, and delete ability inside of the blockchain. Uh, data can be persisted right, as transactions on the blockchain. Um, and um, there's some clear strengths to having your, your um, records on the blockchain. One of them is high availability, because you got multiple computers, multiple peers all working together to back up this data. It's tamper-proof, right? It's cryptographically, uh, cryptographically secure. Uh, there's consensus, right? Because multiple uh, peers agreed to take on these updates. And then you also have a history, right? Once those records are in place and they can't be changed, then uh, they're there forever. But sometimes you may actually want to store your data off the blockchain. And sometimes you want this because you want fast access or a lower cost, or maybe it's easier to change or easier to integrate with your application. So those are all good reasons to consider using your own data store or your own cache. There's some drawbacks to this, though. Uh, there's additional setup and administration, uh, and also data synchronization issues. What I mean by data synchronization issues is if you go and create something in your own data store, but you want that to be reflected on the blockchain as well, you're going to have to make an additional call to push that transaction out and make sure that it gets written to the blockchain. And going the other way as well, if uh, there's independent agents that are registering on the blockchain and you want to be aware of those, you have to go and scan through the transactions, looking for those registrations, picking them up, and then putting them in your own data store. So those are some concrete examples of what I mean by, by synchronization. And then our last category for persisting data is antelope tables. So these are pretty cool because you can actually do updates inside a smart contract. You can update data inside the blockchain. Uh, they're fast and they have indexing. So you get fast lookups um, and you get also ordering of records uh, and you can have multiple indexes on your table. So there's some drawbacks to antelope tables, um, one of them being cost. And the primary driver of cost is going to be the size of the tables, the amount of data that you're storing. So you, you have to be very sensitive to how much data you're going to store because you're going to have to pay for that RAM that's used. Uh, tables don't have history. And of course, tables are updatable. So that means they're not immutable. They're, they're, they, they're, uh, you can change them, and that's by design. So if you bring all that together, what's the recommendation, right? Well, I think when you start out, you want to see if you can get as much data as possible as on the blockchain as transactions. I think that's the place to start. And then it, you may need to consider building your own data store if you need it for integration purposes with how your application's written. You need it for speed of access, or you need it for some certain lookup functionality. 
uh, you know, then you may want to build out your own data store. And lastly, there may be situations where you need fast access and you can pay for it, uh, and you want to update your data right on the blockchain. In those case, those rare cases, you should look at using Antelope tables. Again, you have to be careful with the Antelope tables because they can be expensive. You're going to have to pay for the RAM, CPU, and network that you use. One Before, uh, Eric, just a question on, on storing data, because I, I can imagine a few individuals will probably be thinking about this. So, for example, we look at NFTs. NFTs are very popular. They can often include a very high resolution image, right? A lot of data in an image or maybe video capture. Could you just maybe describe how one goes about best incorporating these higher, uh, higher data uh, capacity aspects into the blockchain? Yeah, in fact, uh, later on, I walk through an example of doing a user profile with, with an avatar oh. and, and sort of go through some of that. But I don't think I answered, you know, I kind of walked through step by step more of a how to, but I didn't think I answered your question on the data storage, right? So, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a great question. So you've got a couple things going on. Uh, let's just take, you know, the account itself, right? You know, that, you know, you want it to be on part of the blockchain. We're going to talk about accounts and permissions. That entity's got to exist. So you got to create some account, right? That's your, going to be your key, and that's going to be the thing that you know, sort of everything is linked to. You know, next we're going to have some information that's associated with that account, right? Uh, you mentioned like an avatar or a video that's associated with it, uh, but there's other things. There could be a full name. We could have extra contact information, like uh, you know, um, Telegram or chat accounts, things like that, that we want to link to it, right? So those are kind of different, different cases. So for the actual accounts that you're, the actual information that you're linking to the account, like the telegram for that person, that's uh, not that ephemeral, right? In other words, it doesn't change a lot. It, it's, it stays around for you know days, weeks, months, maybe even years. So that stuff is great just to write out to the blockchain. So you've got your account, you're writing out, this account and wants to be associated with this Telegram channel. You can write that out. You can write that out to the blockchain. Um, and this is great. So now all that data is available. But if you want to go present it on a website, I have to figure out a way to do that. And typically, what you'll do is you'll scan through those transactions, looking for those either account registrations or looking for transactions that associate the Telegram account with the user. You'll pick up that transaction, you'll find that association, and then you usually put it into your own data store. And then if you have it in your own data store, now it's really easy to show it on the web, right? Because you just basically cache something that's already on the blockchain. And if you're scanning the transactions frequently enough, you'll be able to pick up these changes and you'll be able to put them in your data store. There may be a little bit of a lag, it depends on how often that you check. And then finally, for the image of the video, these are usually pretty large files. So you have a bunch of different choices here. You know, a more traditional example would have put it on like an Amazon S3 or a CDN or some file server that's going to serve that stuff out. You know, a more distributed uh, version of doing this is IPFS, where they actually take your file, chop it up in pieces and spread it out on a network, a distributed, distributed network. Uh, that's another way that you can do it as well. And then you can get into a whole bunch of scenarios about you know, change control, change management, signature verification for that content that you posted right online. You want to make sure that it, if you want to make sure that it's um, a legit copy of the data, make sure that it hasn't changed. There might be some additional features and functionality that you want to add into that to verify it with some change control around it. So now you've got, in total, we've discussed putting data on the blockchain, scanning that, putting it in your own database, and then having these very large media files uh, put out on a third party uh, network of which we have some choices. So that gives you uh, an idea of how all that stuff uh, can come together. And then I'll go into this later on, but you know, you have, you know, you have choices. And so we'll go into if you want to do that, but do it all on the blockchain, how that all on EOS networks uh, blockchain, how that would work. And I think we could support everything, but uh, you wouldn't probably wouldn't want to put these big media files on the blockchain. Everything Cost prohibitive. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great answer. So accounts and permissions. Uh, I 
this is a super interesting feature. So we're going to spend some time kind of walking through it. Um, so bear with me. There's a lot to cover here. Um, accounts are a unique identifier in the EOS network. Uh, and they're used to interact with the blockchain. Uh, permissions are the public-private key pair associated with the account. Right? So we've got two different things, accounts and permissions. Uh, this is different than some blockchains where your, your entity, your account is actually just the public-private key pair. So EOS accounts are human-readable names represented by 12 characters. And EOS permissions associated with the account are used to sign transactions. So, for example, if you have an account, you know, I see Blue Whale, right, that would be the account, and notice the human readable name for it, uh, and they would use their owner permission, right, to sign for a transaction. Just laying on the groundwork here for accounts and permissions. When you create an account, uh, you get some native permissions sort of by default. Owner permissions and active permissions. So this is an account, it's got two permissions, and each permission is represented by a, a public-private key pair. Now, when you just start out, this public-private key pair is the same for both owner and active permissions, but you could change that later. And then when sending a transaction, you can decide which permission you're gonna to utilize to send the transaction, send the transaction and sign it. Um, of course, you can change permissions, and this is where it starts to get interesting because you can actually add and delete custom permissions associated with an account. Each account can have multiple permissions, and permissions can be changed by anyone with the right authority. Uh, account, other accounts can change permissions if they have the right authority, the right access controls. And of course, you could change your own custom permissions on your own account. And finally, there's permission thresholds. So sometimes we want to scope signatures. So permission thresholds require a certain value, so numerical value is reached before the signature is considered value, uh, valid. And that value is calculated by summing together the weights that are associated with each account and its public key. So in practice, what does this mean? It means setting a threshold value require multi-sig, right? Require multiple signers or require an account with a really high weight to it. Uh, and so uh, we'll talk about why this is important from a governance perspective later and why it might be interesting. I want to take a step back here. Um, we talked a lot about accounts, but what happens if you aren't on EOS right now? How would you create your first account? Well, I just want to share these two links. Uh, the first one you can jump into and you can use Fiat uh, to pay for an account. You have to pay for an account because it does require some resources to set up that account. If you already have EOS, uh, you know, here's a way to create your first account. Uh, and of course, this will be uh, recorded and on YouTube, so you can always go back to it, freeze this frame if you want to write down those links. Okay, this is the last uh, capability to go over, and it's actually supported by a third party. I tried to stay high level and not uh, share a lot of specific links. But uh, this one's important to go over. You know, there's a common need to go through and scan or look at the transactions that are part of the blockchain. Uh, we mentioned that with the uh, account registration and looking for, you know, associating a Telegram uh, account, a, a Telegram account with your a blockchain account, many accounts. Uh, and how would you do that? So. Defuse is an example of one third party that you can use. It has HTTP search queries where you can search through transactions. Also, has a GraphQL. Uh, because it's a third party, you're going to need to register separately uh, for these services for this query capability. Oh, and documentation. So, for the latest documentation on Antelope, uh, uh, you can find it at docs.usnetwork.com. Uh, and it also includes how-to guides, software manuals, and references. Okay, now we're going to get into some examples. And um, great to have any questions uh, that you guys have as I walk through these examples. Uh, let's just go and jump right into it. We'll talk about user profile. Um, it was a great question before about the data modeling. Uh, for an account, but here I'm just talking about some of the more specific steps to give you an idea of how things work. 
Um, so first, I mean, so these are the steps of creating an account with a username, avatar, icon, and login credentials. Uh, in this case, you'll need your own data storage solution for the cost-effective, fast retrieval of data. So first, you're going to want to create a public-private key pair. You want to make sure that your new user is getting the private key, and you can um, get a copy of the public key. Using that public key, you can now create an account for that user. And you can do this with a smart contract, or you can also do it with an HTTP API uh, that comes as part of Antelope. Uh, there's some command line tools that are available. Then you can update your data store with a new account and the avatar. Uh, your primary key is going to be that 12 character account name that you created in step two. And the login credentials that you'd use in this case would be the signature produced by the private key. Uh, so this is a just simple, right? Setting up a user profile, some of the steps that you might go through. Now I wanted to talk about uh, IoT and telemetry. And I'm going to go through two examples here, number one and number two. So for the first one, I talk about using your own data store external to the blockchain. And in number two, I talk about using antelope tables. So you can kind of get a sense for that balance. So if you have IoT, you're going to have a lot of devices. You may not know where they are. So device typically, devices will self-register. So distributed network is distributed setup. Devices call in to a smart contract, and they register. and includes information about the type of the device, its location, and the other information that you're interested in. Next, your application would go scan that uh, blockchain transactions looking for registrations. And as you find records that are interesting to you, you record them and you store them in your own database. Now you've got your registration records in your own data store. Then devices will continue to self-report. They'll call into a smart contract pushing telemetry. So whatever telemetry is available for this device, if you had, you know, if your IoT devices were all coffee pots, they might report that they're all online and they report how much coffee they have in their coffee pot, right? Then you would query, right, the blockchain, again, scanning the transactions, looking for these telemetry updates that are pushed in. And as you found the telemetry updates that were interesting, you pair them up with the registrations that you picked up before and put that data into your database. And now that it's in your own database, you can further refine and aggregate right, that data. So this is just a you know, sort of simple example of going through distributed application and how you pull all that stuff together. So this is example number two. It's the same thing, but in this case, uh, we're going to talk about using antelope tables. What's interesting in this case, and you'll see at the end, is there's no external data store. You can actually do everything on blockchain, on US network. So again, devices self-register, call a smart contract. Registration includes the information you care about. But in this case, the smart contract updates the antelope table. The devices then self-report, pushing up the telemetry that's interesting. And in this case, the smart contract actually writes that telemetry to an antelope table in a compact binary form. Because remember, you're going to pay a lot for RAM, so we want to make this as compact as possible. And then lastly, you're going to query. So now you're going to call a smart contract and ask for the data. Since all the data is on the blockchain, you know, you're going to have to call that and pull all that data out with that smart contract. So indexing allows for sorting and filtering. So for example, you could fetch the last 24 hours of data, and you could order it by time to get the most recent records first. And then you can process it, re-aggregate it, do whatever you want to do with it. So that's an example using antelope tables instead of an external data store. I want to go through another example, which was uh, games, right? State of play. Uh, just really simple. I'm going over the state machine and how you might want to model that. Uh, when you start a game, you might call a smart contract to initialize the board and all the pieces. Uh, next, you might have a smart contract for moves. So you'd want to move a piece on the board. Uh, you'd change the state of the game by moving that piece. That smart contract might also evaluate for any important events. For example, if it's a chess game, they'd look for checkmate. And then you may have follow-on state changes, like uh, if that move right ended up in a, in a win or a loss, you would declare the winner and end the game. You probably also want an ability to resign, so one of the players could exit, so a smart contract for a player to exit the game. 
And also end game, right? Uh, probably more of an internal action. Um, you may not need to make that public, but that's when you're cleaning up the uh, data and ending the game. Now, as you see from the out to example, you can use both your, you could either use an external data store or you could use antelope tables. And there's lots of examples of people making games like this on US using, EO, using antelope tables. They've done chess, uh, they've done tic-tac-toe, all sorts of things. So that's why I mentioned that you can bring your own data store or use antelope tables. Uh, and then you'll, it, the data that you do store, you'll probably need to index it by player, by board, and may even need to index it by event, because I assume you'll have also events. I want to go over a couple more examples. We talked a lot about accounts and permissions, and I want to go over some examples about why accounts and permissions are interesting and might, why you might want to explore them. So we're going to go over unlocking levels, VIP events, and changing moderators. So here's the scenario. We want to unlock level three in a game for gamers who completed level two. So here's an, a, a possible way you could do this. Once level two is completed, a grant that gamer's account permission for level three. You can do it via a smart contract uh, that's called after the level is completed. By modeling this with a permission, you keep things simple, right? So you don't need an external data store. All you do is add a permission, it's added to the account. There's no data to sync up, it's just a customer mission. And then once the permission is granted, right? right it's like an entitlement to level three. So once the permission is granted, that entitlement is going to remain unless it's explicitly re removed. The reason that it's nice is because if you change the logic later on for your level progression in your smart contract, for example, you could add a speed play component that you have to complete level two in a certain amount of time before you can progress to level three, uh, that you can certainly add that and all the new gamers coming in trying to make it to level three would have to match that criteria of both of completing the level and doing a certain amount of time in order to progress to the next level. But all of the gamers that have previously gotten that entitlement, previously gotten that permission, will keep it. VIP events. Um, but this could be another common scenario. You want to open up events to VIP members. Uh, so you can write a smart contract and grant permissions for a particular event, right? Because you can create custom permission for an event. If the event is open for a limited time, your smart contract just checks the time and stops granting permissions once that time window is closed. Of course, there's always one-offs, right? That you want to whitelist a specific account to let them uh, enter a VIP event. So you can just push a transaction and add the event permission to specific accounts. It allows you to do that. So here, permissions are a nice cross-cutting feature to allow access to events. Changing a moderator. Um, OK, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. I'm going to try to go over it uh, quickly. Uh, questions would be great to help me focus this one. But uh, here's the scenario. Majority of members on a social network want to elect a new moderator. Right? It's a distributed organization. So how would we do that? Well, one way to think about accomplishing this is to require a signature threshold to grant that moderator permission. If you have a high threshold, it's going to require multiple signers, multiple members to sign that transaction to make that permissions change. And this is a way of enforcing a governance model, right? Because you're saying, hey, you can't just be one person that makes this change. You have to have multiple people working together right, to make this change. If you get the threshold right, you're going to have a majority of the members right there uh, to sign that transaction to make that permissions change. So using the threshold for signatures and the weights that are associated with, per, with account permissions is an interesting way to build a governance model to make changes uh, in your network and allow the participants right, that are in your distributed application to have power over things, but still um, make sure that it's set up in a way that makes sense for the organization that you're trying to build. Now, the reason I said that you could spend a lot of time talking about this is because how would you get the balance right of the thresholds and the weights? You know, how would you make sure that you have a majority? 
right? These are a lot of details that you could go into. I think there's a lot of different ways that you could accomplish that. But what I'm trying to call out here is that that threshold is an interesting way of getting people to collaborate. I've got one more example, and I'm going to jump into the financial realm here. So we're switching gears, and this is order books. Uh, this is something interesting that you can accomplish uh, with analog tables, um, and I'm going to explain why when I go through this example. Uh, it does get pretty financially, so uh, let's go through it. So order books. When I talk about order books, I'm talking about matching up producers and consumers, buyers and sellers. And this is often done by a criteria like, say, price. And sometimes it takes multiple orders to fulfill a desired quantity. So for example, let's say we have a sell order for one unit at $100. And we have one buyer at two tenths of a unit at that same price. So we have a seller for a unit and a buyer for two tenths of that. So we've got eight tenths that have left unfulfilled. What are we going to do? Well, typically what you do is you'll walk through all the orders that are in looking for the criteria that's important, which in this case is price, and trying to match them up until you get an even number of units and you can complete the transaction. So in Antelope, you could do this uh, with, a, with an Antelope table and some indexes. You can imagine a very simple table consisting of an order ID, a type like buy or sell, quantity, and a price per unit. If you create an index on the price and also create an index on order ID, what you'll be able to do is filter by the price, but then order by the order ID. This allows you to say, okay, show me all the orders, the buy and sell orders that have come in at $100 per unit, but order them by the order ID. And the reason the order by an order ID is important is because it allows a first in, first out order flow, where the first person that submitted the order is the first one that you're trying to match up. And that way you can match up buyers and sellers until you get to an even amount, um, like a, even number of units, complete the transaction, and then you can keep going. So that's something that's super interesting that you can do with analog tables because of the multi-indexing, the sorting that's allowed. It's interesting for financial transactions. Eric, got a, a question from Douglas Bootner, who's a very active member in our ecosystem. He's asking if there are any new features that weren't around in EOS IO that would offer new possibilities to developers in Antelope. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, um, of you know, in, in this case, some of the new uh, features. Um, you know, the permissions are the same, the tables are the same. Um, oh. Yeah, we do have uh, something that's new. I think that's a, a interesting to note is a send transaction has been updated uh, for irreversible to be irreversible. So that means uh, by default, you can send it in and it'll keep retrying until the a block is committed or it times out and you get errors back now. So you'll know that your transaction hasn't been completed. So that transaction finality and client support is now much better. Uh, there's also, then along with that, there's some changes for uh, get info. You get better info on the blockchain. But I think that send transaction too would be the one that I'd that highlight and that irreversibility. Cool. Yeah, and then I suppose as as you you go along here, anything else that comes up um, to that topic? I know the the, the conversation of EOSIO versus Antelope is still um, uh, often discussed, and in some cases, people are very. Uh, aggressive towards the idea that EOSAO still gets mentioned. Um, but I think it's important for uh, when the opportunity arises to kind of point out uh, the advancements that Antelope has brought and, and why uh, it would probably encourage the change that are still running EOSIO to eventually migrate to Antelope. I mean, there, there's so much work that went into Antelope and Leap where, you know, the developers got together, you know, took, took a version and really honed that in to make it um, like a good solid, supportable version. Uh, because remember, releasing software, especially the blockchain software, can be difficult. So really got a great uh, flow on it now and really put a good handle on you know, making features and, and making feature changes and things like that. The new 3.0 release, too, you have to remember the community is a big part of this as well. All those block producers, 
you know, they're a big part of this as well. And they're supporting the antelope um, and helping us have a strong network that stays up. We're able to make that switch over that you know, in, in late September, they make that switch over, you know, really seamlessly and uh, without downtime. Uh, so that's great uh, thing that I think signals the strong growth that we're going to have in the future. All right. When I finished up order books, this was actually the last official example that I had. Uh, and that sort of ends my official presentation. Uh, but uh, I did go over a lot of the general features that are available. Uh, and if you guys have any questions or there's any specific scenarios that you want to be that you want to go over, I'd be happy to discuss them. We did get one more um, one more question from Lisa Chandler, who had a really nice comment here. Let me uh, let me pull this off. No, it's just you and I. She had a nice comment and she said that uh, she uh, I love adding this knowledge to her thinking. So um, and, and so will the developers I talk to in the future, she said, uh, this is super valuable. And she's been watching these multiple times, which I'm sure will then include this, uh, this recent uh, workshop live stream event. So thank you, yeah. Eric. And then yeah, she that, had a question. That, that's great that it's, it's useful. I'm, I'm so happy. That's great. Yeah. And then can a community member learn to build and use smart contracts? Or will we always need developers? <laughs> what is the barrier to entry here to become the ability to do this? Are there any scenarios where a community creator can do it themselves? That's yeah, a tough question. Yeah, this this is a this is a great point. You know, and it's the one that's not lost on us, right? It's stuff that we do talk about um, quite a bit. Um, you know, I wish that I had an awesome answer for you, and right now, um, I don't. There, if you go to Doxy US and Network, uh, there's there there have been plenty of examples on building smart contracts, you know, with the C code, you know, and C and make files and things like that. And that's not for everybody, you know, and, and I get that. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, something that um, we can look at doing better at, you know. And I think right now the challenge for us is really looking at you know where we want to invest our resources and and trying to get the best for all, everybody that's involved. Uh, and definitely you make a good point about, you know, better tools. I think we can always do a better job there. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll have, that's something that we'll keep an eye on and, and try to work into uh, all the other asks that we have. I suppose that's one thing that's coming with the trust EVM and in that there are a lot of like Open Zeppelin, I believe, is a repository of a lot of sort of open sourced uh, object oriented maybe is not the right term, but it's like kind of chunks of code you can drag in to your application. Yep. That's probably something that's not quite there in the, the antelope native chain, but something that maybe if you want to develop something, consider using Trust EVM where you can then use those open source uh, code chunks. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think that's good. I think, yeah, so um, there's a lot of stuff that's available in EOS. Uh, but I think the mechanism is a little bit off. In other words, you can you can take this contract, you can copy it, and you can use it, but you're going to have to compile it, right, and then push it out as a transaction. Whereas if you compare that to EVM, right, you've got you know things like Hardhat or Truffle that allow you to build your contracts and test them, like right on your local box. That helps give you confidence that things are working. Open Zeppelin, where you can just copy you know in uh, to match your you know, 721 contract or whatever it is that you're looking for, you know, and just be able to mint tokens uh, uh, super fast by, by copying that out. Um, and then you have some, um, you know, interesting editors, right? IDEs for Ethereum, right? Virtual machine, where you can hop on and try some stuff out. I think they're great for on-ramp, right? For beginners. And I think once you get more into Solidity and, and you want to develop more hardcore contracts, you'll be in VS Code or be in, you know, whatever the IDE is of your choice is. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's some more tools out there and those are definitely possible with, uh, you know, trust EVM. Awesome. Here's another question from uh, Douglas and he says, sorry if, if mentioned earlier, he missed the first part, but can you comment on the compiler support, AKA will there be internal support for, out, for compilers outside of C++? And if so, what languages are a priority if you're able to speak to any of that? Yeah, I can't. So officially, we don't have anything that's part of what was going on in development. But of course, there's a large community, and we use the, um, you know, the WASM 
uh, virtual machine that we use. It's one that's widely available and a lot of people uh, use. And there are open source projects out there that do support different languages. Uh, Go, Rust, uh, TypeScript. But I haven't actually tried any of those out myself. So I don't know personally how well they're going to work and what level of support. You know, with C++, you have some built-in types like time and some other things that may not be available that you would have to sort of replicate, right, in, uh, in another language that's there. That, that would be a thing that I want to look into. Uh, any actions that uh, or functions that are available in the C++ code, you might have to rebuild by sending tr transactions directly onto the blockchain to, to get that work done. So I haven't actually tested out those integration steps, it's really hard for me to speak to them, but I have seen quite a few TypeScript, Go, and Rust. Yeah, I think even in, in the Pomelo seasons, we've seen, uh, I think there's a Python library that's been worked on and, and a few others there mm -hmm. that come up. I think that it's where a great use of Pomelo for public good, right? Obviously different uh, language integrations is, is certainly a public good in the blockchain space. So I think uh, that's probably a good place to look when we're looking for other languages and see what's coming up on Pomelo and then following those projects. Uh, okay, we've got another question from Lisa. Thank you. Are there any grants that could help fund the hardware servers and developers beyond the Ideathon? If a good idea and we wanted to do it, might there be resources to help? Um, well, depending, I, I don't know if I could probably uh, slightly answer this, uh, Eric, and then you can take a stab if you want. But um, I think in the end, uh, like Pomelo is one, it depends on the nature of your project. And so if you're creating uh, a public good, then certainly that is the place to go is Pomelo, where you could submit a, a grant on Pomelo and receive community support and then receive a, sec a portion of the matching pool using the quadratic uh, nature of Pomelo. And if you're creating something that uh, is safe for social good, the social good category, that's a great one where you might, uh, it's, it's a social good. A lot, a lot of times those are in fact public goods. And um, if you had enough people who were supportive of the social good, then you could get a lot of support in Pomelo, which then equates into a, a large portion of the matching pool. Um, uh, the other option, uh, so generally like submit your idea in the idea thon, and there will be a lot of eyes uh, looking at the ideas. And if there's some really great projects in there, I expect uh, Helios will be looking and we'll be running uh, an incubator program uh, to help support uh, projects and help build out their pitch deck in, in, in search of financing and search of funding. There's also uh, the ENF will certainly be paying attention and I'm sure they are keen. We know they're keen to build on the EOS network. And if they see some great ideas come through, uh, they might be uh, looking to support projects. There's also the other chains. Uh, you know, th this idea, EVM X Ideathon, is open to all uh, chains, really, right? We can, uh, there's Telos projects, Wax. Um, so we can see a lot of other chains might look to what the projects come out of that and say, hey, love your idea. Why don't you come build on our and we'll, our project or our platform and we'll give you some support. So, um, so just, I don't know, that's maybe a loose answer. There's no specific grants to really uh, dial in on your question, but I think there's a lot of options out there um, to consider it at least. Any comment on that, Eric, or does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. I, I'm not really in this space as much, um, doing a lot of tech stuff, so I, I can't really answer it. Perfect. No problem. Um, I think yeah, Douglas Bootner had a couple comments here. Uh, just speaking to uh, it's risky to build uh, on some of the other languages um, if it's uh, not supported. If it's an unsupported compiler, it gets risky to build on, um, which is kind of to your point, right? You haven't tried any of these other languages yet. I think. Yeah, that's that right. Sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a point there, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I could probably work, like me personally, I could probably work on it and get it to work. But then there's, like Doug mentions, there's also the support question. So even if you could get it to work, right, there's changes that happen, things that update and, you know, things yeah. that change. Yeah. And you want that confidence, that support, that you're not going to go into this every single time and have to debug something, you know, or upgrade something or the latest upgrade that you took, you know, was a breaking change in a, in a way, a de you know, the dependency that you didn't realize. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And this is, you know, this kind of yeah, Douglas's comment here, right? There are several uh, uh, community options available, but they would probably break. I think this is still something holding antelope chains uh, back, basically, from playing well with others. Um, 
it's probably fair, but I, I think in terms of the roadmap, it's uh, there's so many things on the go. There's only so much that uh, the ENF or the EOS or the Ant sorry the Antelope uh, Coalition can do, and uh, I'm sure it's it's on the roadmap at some point to expand into other uh, communities, like you say, but all in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a here's a, just a general question. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about mining as a game on EOS? What wallets would be best? Any any thoughts on on wallets? Um, mining as a game. I mean, uh, I think there's so many within different games. There is like resource collection. So you can if Alien Worlds and any of these games that have internal resources, that's kind of mining, I suppose. If that's what you mean. But uh, what about uh, any suggestion or talk on uh, considerations on wallets? Eric, in, in your experience with Antelope? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm mostly dealing with the SDKs. And so I am, you know, you know it's funny. So most, most of my time is just dealing with stuff like just in the SDK myself, sort of replicating things that you might want to do in, in the wallet. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, what I, my suggestion would be is to go and look at, you know, like papers or Yield Plus or look at the POM, the grants and see what wallets are getting those grants. See what wallet providers may be part of a Yield Plus, you know, blue paper, right? And those are the organizations that I think are invested in the community, are getting funded from the community, and that you can continue to rely on. And, and that would be my way of going through and trying to try out some wallets and pick which one is best. I didn't quite understand the mining for a game. I'm, I think as an engineer, I take everything literally, so I need I need help on uh, the thoughts there, expanding on them. Yeah, she she was talking the, the claim button. So I think it is like an in-game resource claiming using a wallet to, to submit that transaction. Um, oh yeah. So I think you know, I, that'd be great, I, you know, because the the wallet should be able to handle the irreversible transaction, giving you an error if you're not able to get it. Um, being able to refund if you have like uh, you can because you can set up stuff so you can, you know, provide money, funds, tokens at a later time or based on certain criteria. And the wallet will be able to handle that and also be able to do refunds if that transaction can't go through for a particular reason. So, you know, definitely it's nice to use wallets for those things. Yeah, and she clarified like Alien Worlds, which is exactly it's a, there's resources in that game, and I think uh, in terms of really well supported in terms of community view and just experience with uh, the ecosystem is Graymass. Uh, Aaron Cox and the Graymass team they have been working on uh, authenticators, uh, key stores um, for EOSIO now Antelope for since the beginning. Uh, so I think everyone's quite familiar with them, and they've done quite well, deservedly so, in uh, previous Pomelo seasons. Um, and I think their their new uh, wallet is called Unicove, and I think that's all available on the Graymass website. I'm pretty sure it's still early stages for Unicove, but um, that's a more uh, traditional wallet. I think that folks are going to be used to uh, in terms of user experience. Right. Yeah. In the earlier in the presentation, I had a link to Unicove. Uh, it's a great way to create your first EOS account using fiat if um, you don't have an EOS account. Yeah, that's exactly right. And for those watching, uh, if you like uh, Lisa's ideas, uh, help her do it. So mm -hmm. for to those uh, looking for partners or looking for uh, folks to team up with, um, there you go. And I'm sure uh, you can find uh, Lisa's uh, name in the in the chat. You can probably look her up. I, I recognize the name. I think Lisa's an Eden, Eden member, for example. We've got the Eden election coming up on uh, Saturday. And uh, I've seen in the community. So join up make some uh, make some friends and uh work together to submit a project for the uh, ideathon for sure um well i think eric this has been a, a successful uh and it, we, 54 minutes this has gone uh, pretty good so we've covered a lot of detail if folks want to reach out to you after this to ask some uh, other questions is there a best place they should try to get you um that that would be make sense yeah find me on telegram at eric passmore I'm basically at Eric Passmore everywhere, right? Yeah. LinkedIn, uh, uh, at on Telegram, GitHub. Perfect. No secret okay. identity. People will find you. And of course, we do have in the EOS Network Foundation, the EOS uh, public main Discord channel, there is an uh, EVM XIDF on Hackathon channel there. 
definitely bring your questions there. Um, you can probably tag at Eric Passmore there. Certainly, uh, I'm watching that. And if I see anything that's uh, suited for Eric, I'll uh, make sure I uh, tag him so we can have him or any of the other brilliant developers on the ENF also have a look. Um, and just uh, and also for those uh, looking to uh, work with Lisa Chandler, there's her, uh, there's her at Lisa Chandler. Yep. So there you can find her. And anyone else looking for teammates, by all means, you know, use these live uh, opportunities to to kind of reach out, especially at the end like this. This is a free format, so it's very easy. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Eric. Definitely appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone else, for your time. And I uh, love the engagement. We do this uh, next week. We've got Design Thinking Workshop. Uh, the week after that, we've got community marketing, uh, community development as the uh, the last sort of live stream. And earlier in this uh, presentation, I forgot what the other uh, EVM slash the Ideathon category, it was DeFi. So for the Ideathon, you've got GameFi, DeFi, Social Good, Gov3, and Web3. So between those five categories, uh, there is a very, very good chance that your idea will fit somewhere in there. Um, and if you're curious as to what those categories all stand for, I encourage you to head over to the evmxideathon.devpost.com website, and you will find them all listed there along with the judging criteria. So you know uh, how will you be judged. So that will help you kind of curate your idea and your presentation to get the most points. So you have a chance to win. Right on. Thank you, Eric. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.